to understand her love by being in her mood. He comes to understand the ecstasy that she feels when she's in love with him. Mm -hmm. And he comes to understand her point of view, her perspective, the particular sweetness that she sees in Krishna that nobody else can see in him but her. He comes to understand these three things. Mm -hmm. And how special is that? People are always looking for the perfect romantic story. This is the greatest romance in, in, in all eternity. God pursuing the depth of understanding of his lover, Srimati Radhika. No greater love story. And he comes in her mood. And he comes at a time in Kali Yuga, when it's time to for the avatar to appear to give the holy name, okay. as the Yuga Dharma of the age, so he comes to give this Yuga Dharma. The holy name of Krishna. But it's very special when he comes. When he comes to give the holy name, he's coming to give Prem Nam Sankirtan. And what is Prem Nam Sankirtan? Prem Nam Sankirtan is the mood of service to his beloved Radhika. coming to give something very special, which is not given in any other time. Only when Krishna personally comes as Lord Chaitanya does he give this particular move of love for the service of his consort, Srimati Radha. Mm -hmm. Very special. So, Mahaprabhu's whole manifestation is about tasting love and distributing love. And because he is, that's why he's called the Mol Mahavaranaya, he's the most munificent, uh, Odarya. Odarya means munificence. He's the most munificent. Wait, can you break that down one more time? Because I don't understand munificence. Munificence, <laughs> munificence means, means that no one is more charitable and more giving Generous. and more giving. He doesn't, no one gives more. No one gives greater gifts. No manifestation of God that ever appeared in this universe has ever given a greater gift to humanity 
than the gift that Mahaprabhu gives in Prem Nam Sankirtan and love of Srimati Radhika. No one. Therefore, he's considered the most munificent avatar because he's giving the greatest thing, the greatest love. He's pursuing personally the depth of understanding of that love. And as he tastes it, he's distributing it. There's no holding back. He just gives it. Very, very sweet. All sweetness. Mahaprabhu is about all sweet. And when he comes, he brings with him, you see the picture there, Panchatattva, there's five personalities. There's Mahaprabhu is in the center. He comes with his brother Balaram. Huh? Krishna comes with Balaram, who's Nityananda. And with Advaita, who's Mahavishnu avatar. And Gadadhar Pandit, who is Radhika. And Srivast Thakur, who's Narada Muni, or Bhakta avatar, the devotee. So, these great devotees, they wanted something special. They knew that this particular manifestation of Krishna was the most merciful. And so they all made special requests. Nityananda requested that in this Kali Yuga, I want you to give your mercy to all the Jagais and Madai. Do you know who Jagai and Madai are? Yes. Jagai and Madai were two Brahmins oh. <laughs> who became the most sinful people in Navadri. Very, very sinful. They committed all kinds of sins. I'll tell you in a few minutes what kind of sins they committed. <laughs> So Jagai and Madai, when Lord Chaitanya told Nityananda, I want you to distribute this love of God. I want you to go door to door and get everyone to chant and distribute this love of God. What I'm giving, I want you to give it to them. So Nityananda, who is a Kanda Guru Tattva, he's the root of all Guru. He, all Gurus get their power from Nityananda. He's the one who gives the power to the Guru. He is the supreme personality of Guru. So Nityananda, he goes from door to door, knocking on the doors. And how does he distribute love of God? He bows down to everybody when he comes to the door. He glorifies the person. Oh, my dear sir, how wonderful you are. You're very great. I'm very nice. glad to meet you. Today I want to give you a gift, because you're such a great personality. Great humility, great affection, great love. Then, he teaches him to chant the holy name of Krishna, and the person becomes very happy. Very happy. But when Nityananda was going from door to door, he saw these two, Jagai and Madai, drunk completely drunken and beating people up and screaming and yelling and stealing from people and beating people and committing all kinds of horrendous acts. You're familiar with this, right, Sam? What's that? Horrendous? Yes. Very. <laughs> <laughs> it's just munificent anyway. <laughs> so, Nityananda thought, Lord Nityananda was thinking, if I can convert these two, if I can make them devotees of Mahaprabhu, if I can see that they get the mercy of Mahaprabhu, then everyone will drown in the mercy of Mahaprabhu, in the ocean of Mahaprabhu. Everyone. These are the most needy. He didn't look for an easy target. You know. <laughs> he went after the rhinoceros. 
You know that story, shoot for the rhinoceros? No. During the British Empire, when they were colonializing Africa and India, they used to have a saying, shoot for the rhinoceros, because the rhinoceros is a very hidden animal, very shy. It doesn't come out very easily. And then when he comes out, even if you have a big gun, it's hard to put him down. If you can shoot him before he runs you over. It was really hard to bag a rhinoceros and hunt it. So if someone goes for the rhinoceros and he gets it, then he gets applauded. Hmm. And if he doesn't get it, then everyone, no one will criticize him. You know? Everyone will say, it's too hard. <laughs> so, but at least you try. <laughs> <laughs> so this was Nityananda's thinking. I'm shooting for the rhinoceros. So he approaches the two brothers with Aridas Takor, and the two brothers, they uh, start chasing after him to beat him <laughs> in a drunken rage, shouting serious expletives along the way. So Nityananda and Haridas Thakur run for their lives and they escape. But the next day Nityananda, Nityananda Prabhu goes back. Tries again. He's very determined. He wants to give out this love of God. So Jagai and Madai become really angry and Madai takes a clay pot, which they were drinking the wine from, and he throws it and hits Nityananda in the head and cuts his head and he's bleeding. And then he sees that he's not, he, he tried to kill him. And he saw that he didn't die from the first blow, so he picked up a stone. Now he's going he's gonna to finish the job. <laughs> but Jagai, he looked at it and he said, you know what? This person's actually innocent. And he's being hurt for no reason. So he grabs Madai's arm and he says, no, don't do this. Don't hurt this man. He's an innocent man. And Madai was angry. He was in a drunken rage. Meanwhile, some devotees who were with Nityananda went to Lord Chaitanya and said, you know what happened? When Lord Chaitanya hears this, he goes into a rage. And for a moment, he loses his mood as the munificent avatar of love. And he comes upon the scene with his Sudarshan chakra, his flaming disc, and he's going to sever the heads of Jagai and Madai. So when he arrives on the scene, Lord Nityananda puts his hand up and he grabs Lord Chaitanya's arm and he says, what are you doing? You came here to give love. You didn't come here to kill the Jagai and Madai. He said, you're going to kill them with this disc? Are you, killing, are you going to kill everyone? in Kali Yuga, because this is what Kali Yuga is going to look like, them. <laughs> this is what most of the population is going to be like, drunken brawlers. So are you going to take this disc and just destroy everybody? You've got to give them your mercy. So then Mahaprabhu retracts his Sudarshan Chakra. And he says, how can I give them mercy when they offended you? And he said, don't you know that when Madai went to hit me with a stone and kill me, Jagai grabbed his arm and protected me? He said, oh, Jagai protected you? Then he has my mercy. So immediately he gives his mercy to Jagai. But then Madai said, but, but, you're giving him mercy and you're not giving me mercy? <laughs> We've done everything together. We were, we, we were sinners together. We committed all the heinous acts together. We've done anything, everything together. And now you're not going to give me mercy? And so Lord Chaitanya looks at him and he says, Nityananda forgives you and gives you this mercy. And then then, 
Madai falls at the feet of Lord Nityananda. He grabs his feet and he begs him, please, give me your mercy. Please forgive me. I'm sorry that I hit you. Sorry, Paul. Okay, thank you, yes. Yeah, Thanks, Paul. Thank you. I'm talking about Lord Chaitanya. Oh, wow, beautiful. So, Lord Nityananda picks up Madai and he grabs him and he embraces him and he says, yes. I forgive you completely. So then he falls at the feet of Lord Chaitanya, and Lord Chaitanya then blesses him. He says, now that you have Nityananda's mercy, I give you mercy also. So then Lord Nityananda, he asked Madai, he asked Mahaprabhu, he said, I want that you should give me the following benediction, that in all of Kali Yuga, your mercy, this love, this prema, you will give this love, this mercy that you've given Jagai Madai today, you'll give it to everyone in Kali Yuga. You'll give it all the Jagais and Madais, you'll bestow it upon all of them. The Mahaprabhu said, yes, I will bestow this mercy on all the Jagais and Madai. And, and when this whole scene was going on, the demigods from the celestial regions and Yamaraj himself, who was in charge of the nether regions, all came to witness what was going on. So Yamaraj, sitting on his celestial chariot and watching the scene below, turned to Chitragupta, his chief lieutenant, and said, Mahaprabhu has said that he's forgiven all the sins of Jagai and Madai. What were the sins of Jagai and Madai that he forgave them? And Chitragupta won. Oh, you want me to describe the sins of Jagai and Madai? He said, yes, I need to know what it was that Mahaprabhu accomplished. He said, you know that we have millions of scribes who go throughout the world writing down on notes, seeing and watching everybody who commits sins and making notes of it and bringing it back to the messengers, bring it back to the scribes to so enter it into the books. He said, Jagai and Madai committed so many sins that all the messengers were engaged only in accounting. <laughs> they had no time to account for anybody else's sins in the world except the sins of Jagai and Madai because they continuously committed sins every second. There were so many sins that the scribes filling the books day and night, day and night, had no rest and were crying in pain from writing all the sins of Jagai and Madai, book after book after book, piled as high as a mountain. <clears throat> no sin that has ever been committed in the past, nor any sin that will be committed in the future, was not already committed by Jagai and Madai. And Mahaprabhu took all those sins and he made them the size of a sesame seed and threw it into the ocean. Yamaraj heard this, he passed out, unconscious, because he couldn't fathom the depth of the mercy of Mahaprabhu. He couldn't fathom it. It was unbelievable. This is the mercy. So this was the first request by Nityananda. Yamaraj is revived by Narada Muni. Narada Muni passes by, he sees Yamaraj lying on the chariot, and Chitrabhukta asks him, can you please help me? My master is unconscious. So Narada Muni is with Shiva and Brahma and Indra, and he says, okay, come on, let's do Kirtan. Narada Muni starts playing his veena and he starts singing and doing kirtan. Narada Muni Bajaya Veena 
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. A beautiful kirtan and then Yamaraja Prabhupada. And so in this way, we see that Mahaprabhu, mercy was so great that even the demigods became engaged in the chanting and dancing of the Hare Krishna. In celebration of the conversion of Jagannath. So then, that was the first one. Nityananda said, I want you to give this mercy to all the Jagannath. Then Advaita Charya, he asked Mahaprabhu, because he had held a special ceremony in his home called the Shraddha ceremony. And then there's a special plate of prasadam which is offered to the deities. It's called the Shraddha Patra. And it's supposed to be offered to the chief Brahmin of the assembly at the meeting, the chief priest. Amongst all the Brahmins who were there, that person is considered the most exalted. And so of all the persons, he offered it to Haridas Thakur. Now, Haridas Thakur is born a Muslim. But because he continuously chants the holy name of the Lord 300,000 times a day, Advaita Charya considered him to be the topmost Brahmin. But initially the Brahmins were angry and they were ready to leave. But then someone convinced them of the glory of Haridas Thakur. So, Aridas Thakur is considered a Malecha, a Yavana. Very, you know, there's different class, castes in Vedic society. Brahmins, Chatriyas, the warriors, Brahmins, the priests, the Chatriyas, the warriors, the Vaishas, the, the agriculturalists, and the, and the merchants, and the bankers, and then the Shudras, the laborers, and then below that is considered the dog eaters, the Malechas, and the Yavanas. But because Advaita Acharya gave his mercy to Haridas Thakur, who was considered to be a Matri Yavan. So then he asked Mahaprabhu that I want you to give me the benediction that this love of God that you're giving out will not only be given out here in India, I want you to give it out all over the world to all the Malachas and Yavanas as well. Mahaprabhu gave him that benediction. And then Vasudev Dutt, he made a request of Mahaprabhu. He said, I want you to give me the sins of everybody in the whole universe. And I'll take all the sins, and I'll stay here and suffer for them, and you liberate everybody else. So Mahaprabhu said, okay. I'll liberate everyone, and I'll liberate you too. <laughs> You don't have to stay here. So. so because of these three requests, and because of a prediction that Mahaprabhu made, Nagaradi Gram, my name will be heard in every town and village of the world. Because he made this prediction, because of these requests, he made this prediction, my name will be heard in every town and village of the world. Now notice how Mahaprabhu, he's not the one who's actually directly distributing the mercy in one sense. Of course he's distributing the mercy, but he's got his agents, they're all doing it. <coughs> so of course, how the mercy gets distributed all over the world, that's another beautiful story. That's the story of Prabhupada. Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada is, was actually given the position of 
according to one of his god brothers, Srila Bhakti Raksha Sridhar Goswami, of being Nityananda Avesh, a Shaktavesh avatar of Lord Nityananda. Because he came and fearlessly, like Nityananda, went to all the countries of the world to give out Mahaprabhu's mercy. He went to America with nothing, all by himself. He lived in the Bowery, which is a rough area. I was a strapping lad when I was 17, 18 years old, but I wasn't going down to the Bowery. <laughs> and he walked the Bowery fearlessly, stepping around the drunks in order to preach. He endured a lot. He preached all over the United States. He preached in Mexico. He preached in Canada. Venezuela. He went to Hong Kong. He went to Singapore, Malaysia. He went to Australia. He went back to India and he preached all over India. He preached in England, France, Italy, Germany, Sweden, and several other countries. And he preached in Africa. He went to Kenya. He went to South Africa. And he preached there. He covered the globe. He preached all over the world. When he went to Kenya, there was a Hindu temple. Years ago, the Hindus pretty much controlled the city of Nairobi. There wasn't many African people who lived in the cities. They lived mostly in the rural area. And after independence, when Jomo Kenyatta had achieved independence for Kenya, <coughs> many of the people moved into the city. And so as the Indians got phased out, the places which they, the, which were Indian areas where they had their temples became African areas. But the temples were still there. But there was a sort of policy that, you know, this is for the Indians in here. So when Swami Prabhupada came there to Nairobi, they held a program at the at Sanatan Dharma Temple in Nairobi. There was thousands of African people standing outside trying to see what was going on. And he told them, I won't do this program unless you open the doors and let everybody in. I want everyone to get the mercy. And everyone came in. And he gave the mercy to everyone. He chanted, he had them all chant, and he distributed the mercy to everyone. This is why he's Nityananda there. Senabhakta. Huh? Senabhakta. Senapati. Senapati Bhakta. The, the, the chief lieutenant of Mahaprabhu. <laughs> Who's that? Sue Sue Davy. The flower girl. <laughs> so How are you, Sue Davy? Thank you so much for coming. Come in, sit down, go sit next to her. Sit next to Taruni. Sit over there. Can I ask one question? I don't know if you can or not, but you may. <laughs> I was just wondering. Um, you said that. Um, I was wondering what the difference is because they say that all pure devotees are like Baladev Prakash, Nityananda Prakash, but yeah. but that Sri the Sridhar Maharaj said that he was Nityananda Avesh. I'm wondering what the difference is there. Being Nityananda Prakash is a general understanding that all gurus are empowered by Lord Nityananda. Mm -hmm. But he was saying that Prabhupada was like an expansion of Nityananda himself. Wow. And that he had a very powerful... Because otherwise, who could have done this? Mm -hmm. In 11 years, he established 108 preaching centers all over the world. Who could have done that in 11 years? And printed 100 books? Translated and printed 100 books? Mm -hmm. 
Not possible. Not possible for just anyone to do that. You have to be specially empowered. And that's why Srila Prabhupada, he had so many God brothers. He had so many disciples of his God brothers, all of whom he had asked to go and preach. He asked Govinda Maharaj or Sri Maharaj and his disciples to preach in the West. He asked uh, Bhakti Bhattirka Maharaj to preach in the West. He asked his God brother Bhakti Bhattirka Maharaj to preach in the West. And although he asked them all to go and preach in the West, there was one particular person whom he specifically asked. I want you to take care of my disciples. I want you to train them and preach to them. He specifically asked that. That's a very special request. And that was Sri Narayanar. And he took it very seriously. And that's why he was so successful. Because just the Srila Saraswati Thakur had given the blessing to Prabhupada mm -hmm. to continue the work which he had accomplished. He had accomplished in a few short years. He had made 64 months all over India and established Gaudiya Mat. Then he passed that power on to Prabhupada through Srila Bhakti Pradhyan Kishore Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, the order of my Guru Maharaj entered the heart of Srila Bhakti Pradhyan Kishore Maharaj and was and thus the order was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. huh? So when he was leaving this world, Prabhupada left on the 14th of November. On the 13th of November, he requested for the second or third time, you must go and travel and preach and take care of all my disciples and train them and give them all this knowledge. Passed that power, that Shakti unto Sri Vinay Maharaj. He empowered him to do this. No one, all of those persons had some success. Sri Bhakti Bhai Bhakpuri Maharaj, Sri Bhakti Bhai Bhakirtha Maharaj, Sri Govinda Maharaj, they all had success preaching in the West. Why? Because Prabhupada gave them the power. Mm -hmm. Without his blessing, you can't preach all over. He's the one who fulfilled that mission. Mahaprabhu gave out, he promised, I'll give it to all the Jagais and Madais, to all the Malachas and Yavanas, to everyone in the whole universe, I'll liberate them. My name will be heard in every town and village. And the person who fulfilled that was Prabhupada. He is a special, special servant of Lord Chaitanya. He was the one who gave it out to everybody. No matter what race, color, or creed, no matter what gender, he gave it to everyone. So this is the munificence of Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is giving out this love. He's distributing it to everybody. And he has his agents who have helped him to accomplish this. So he's Krishna. He's come in the mood of Radharani. And he appeared in a Brahmin family in 1486. The reason I'm going over this biography is because someone told me, yes, Lord Chaitanya is the guy who took sannyas from a Muslim. So I'm trying to clarify that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's just a misunderstanding. Obviously, you got some misinformation. I'm trying to clarify his background. <laughs> so, uh, he appeared in a Brahmin family. And uh, he became the master of Nyaya, which is logic. He became a, a master logician. 
and as a master logician, he taught the principles of logic and the principles of logical knowledge and reasoning to many, many students. And then he went to perform the ceremony for his father. His father passed away just after he graduated from school. And uh, when his father passed away, then he, every year, is supposed to perform a ceremony by going to the holy city of Gaia. So he went to Gaia to perform the ceremony on behalf of his father. And at that time, he met his Guru Maharaj, Srila Madhavendra Puri, um, excuse me, Ishwar Puri. And actually, Ishwar Puri can't really be Krishna's guru because he's Krishna. <laughs> but to teach us that you always have to have a guru, he accepts the guru. He accepts initiation from Ishwar Puri and then he becomes absorbed instead of the wranglings of logician, logic and, and, and gyan and knowledge, he now becomes a bhakta, a devotee. He's always chanting the name of Krishna. Mm. But he realizes that many people don't will, will accept him as an authority since he's a householder. He's a married man. So as being one of the many married men who are Brahmins, and being young Brahmin at that, mm. his authority was not so acceptable. So in order to spread love of God, he gave up his wife, gave up his mother, he gave up his family, and took sannyas from Keshava Bharti, who was a Mayavadi sannyasi. It means a, a sannyasi from the school of impersonalists. Because at that time, the Mayavadi sannyasis were more accepted than the Vaishnava sannyasis. So he became a Mayavadi sannyasi, and then he preached as a Mayavadi sannyasi, but he preached bhakti, pure bhakti. And he went to live in uh, Jagannath Puri at the behest of his mother. And not only did he give out this chanting to, you know, because he traveled the whole of India, South India, North India, everywhere. But not only did he give out the chanting to the human beings, but he also traveled through the Jari Kunda forest mm -hmm. and chanted to the animals. He had lions and deer dancing together. He had elephants dancing. He had all of the dangerous animals dancing and chanting and singing the songs of Hare Krishna. The trees swaying. And he gave it out to living entities. Everyone. Everyone got so Lord Chaitanya, no one gave what Lord Chaitanya did. No one gave it on that on that level. He's the most magnificent avatar. But he has agents. And certainly Srila Saraswati Thakura Prabhupada and our Srila Prabhupada and Srila Narayan Maharaj, they were special agents of Lord Chaitanya. Because you can't travel unrestrictedly around the world and preach like that unless you have been given the direct blessings. Well, therefore, we're very fortunate that we got a chance to associate with such great personalities and get their mercy. Go for it. But with fortune comes responsibility. It's like Mahaprabhu, as he was tasting the nectar of Srimati Radharani's love as he was becoming deeper and deeper and more deeply absorbed in her love for him and understanding what that love was. He was distributing it. The more mercy you get, the more love you get, the more you distribute. That's the responsibility. You have to give. You're not supposed to keep it. <laughs> you don't be a miser. <laughs>
This is why old Prabhu Narayan Maharaj was 90 years old, he was still traveling and preaching. Because you have to give mercy. You have to give mercy. Right, Sam? Can't hold back. Pardon? You can't hold back. So when you get mercy, Sam, then you have to distribute it. And you have to make that personal. <laughs> <laughs> trying to lure you in. I mean, all right. So, this is a very special. So does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask about Lord Chaitanya? Mm -hmm. I didn't I have one about Lord Chaitanya, but I did have one about Bhagavad Gita. Okay. It, it is a bit of a basic question. I, I just wanted some clarity because I've started reading I actually meant to bring it with me so that I could read one quote from it, but I didn't. Um, I, I, just, I just started reading Gurudev's Gita because I you know, they just did the new edition, so I just got a copy. And um, I'm just up to chapter 4, and I was just, um, I mean, Gurudev's saying in there, for, I, I just wanted to make sure that I've got this right. If we're not renounced, it's saying that we should practice nish karm karm yoga. Is that right? We should just give, do everything for Krishna. Keep doing our karma, but do it all for Krishna. Krishna is very merciful. Uh -huh. Remember what I was telling you last night? He knows that there's so many different kinds of living entities, so he appears in so many different forms in order to attract everyone. Mm -hmm. But he also gives you so many ways to come to him. He says in the Gita, when people have material desires and they worship the demigods for material pleasure, I make their faith strong. Because having faith in a deity which is greater than themselves is better than having no faith at all. So he starts the principle of what he's giving out is faith, which leads to love. He wants the love. That's what he wants. But in order to get it, you have to have faith. When a man and a woman meet, before the woman will give her love, she has to have faith that the person she's giving her love to is not going to exploit her or abuse her. When faith develops, love is given. So, Krishna wants you to have faith. Because faith will lead to love. And so therefore, Krishna is always making arrangements for you to have faith in whatever it is that you have some desire to have faith in. So initially, you may want material things. In Vedic culture, there's four activities. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Dharma means religious ceremonies and religious activities and pujas and yagyas. So to whom do you perform that? Well, if you want Artha, which is money, economic development, and first you worship Saraswati so you get a good education. Because by getting a good education, then you get a good job. <laughs> and then you worship Ganesh to remove all the obstacles to getting the money. <laughs> and then you worship Watch me to make sure that she gives you the money. <laughs> and then kama is sense gratification. So sense gratification comes from having a relationship with the opposite sex. So you worship Shiva and Parvati to get a good husband or a good wife. So dharma is used for getting money and pleasure. Artha and kama. And then, when you start to realize the futility of money and pleasure, <laughs> and you want to get liberated from this world, then you perform jnana. 
which gives you moksha, liberation. So all dharma is really for is facilitating your personal sense gratification. So this is why Mahaprabhu comes and he gives Prema Pumartha Maham, the fifth goal of life, which is praying, love, love for God. So Krishna is always giving you faith. He knows that it's a long haul. We, we go through a lot of births. So incrementally, we start with some desire to worship a demigod. Okay, so you're worshiping the demigod. I'll give you faith. But understand that whatever benedictions you get from them come from me alone. I'm the one who's giving them. And then he tells you that when he's talking to Arjuna, he says, now look, the best thing is Mamanabhava Madhbhakto. The best thing is to always think of me, always worship me, always surrender to me, always do everything for me. Make me the center of your entire life and meditate on me always with love and affection and devotion. This is Rag Bhakti. This is spontaneous love. Then he says, okay, now if you can't do that, then execute the principles of Vaidhi Bhakti. Way you're doing Vaidhi Bhakti. Now, Vaidhi Bhakti is different from Rag Bhakti. Rag Bhakti is love. Does anyone have to teach a woman to love her baby? There's no school or education for this. She gets pregnant, she's in love. <laughs> she loves the baby, she's ready to take care of the baby, she gives everything her whole life to her baby, she gives her breast milk to her baby, everything. She loses sleep for her baby. <laughs> Everything for her baby. The love is very intense. She sacrifices everything to satisfy the baby and take care of the baby. This is natural. Natural inclination. In India, when a woman has a baby, she usually gets a family member who's around 10 to 12 years old, young girl, to come and assist her. Initially, the girl has no connection with that baby. But, when she associates with the mother and sees the love of the mother for the baby and begins to execute the duties that she's assigned by the mother to take care of the baby, gradually she develops as much love for the baby as the mother has. And eventually she would even sacrifice her own life in order to protect the baby. Now, could she learn that at school? No. Could she learn it from a book? No. Only by associating with someone who has that love and executing the services under their guidance does she obtain that mood. And this is the principle of Rag Bhakti. Rag Bhakti means that you associate with a great sadhu like Srila Prabhupada, Srila Gurudev, who has the love, and execute your service, anugatya, under their guidance. And then that love comes to your heart in their association. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. So when Krishna says, if you can perform rag bhakti, then do vaidhi bhakti. What's vaidhi bhakti based on? Fear and intellectual analysis. I'm afraid if I don't do my bhakti, then I'll have to suffer my karma. Mm. <laughs> and I know I've got some bad karma. Right, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> I better do Vaidhi Bhakti. <laughs> That's my only way out. <laughs> so this is fear. And fear can work for a while. I mean, you know, these are two big emotions, fear and love. And people can control other people with fear, but it doesn't last. I mean, there's only so long that someone's going to submit to being in a fearful condition. And they're either going to break away or they're going to die. So fear is not a permanent emotion, but love is. Okay? Love is. And so, initially you may have some fear in Vaidhi Bhakti, but then as you get to practice it and understand it, and you start to realize intellectually, this is the best pro this is the process. There's no other process but this. And when you 
Then you're executing it out of intellectual analysis. Well, I've analyzed everything else, and I'm going to do this because this works. And so you're still not on the love platform yet, but at least you're not on the fear platform. You're on the intermediate platform. So Krishna advises, do Vaidhi Bhakti if you can't do Rag Bhakti. Then he says, after that, in the 12th chapter, he says, well, okay. Now, if you can't do Vaidhi Bhakti, then just work for me, Nishkar Karma Yoga. And Prabhupada, you know, applied that in America. He had many young men who really didn't understand, you know, they, they chanted, you know. We didn't all chant when we were supposed to chant, or as much as we were supposed to chant, we chanted. But we worked. We worked hard. We all worked hard. He was our, he was our man, he was our savior, he was our leader, <laughs> we, were, we were his crew, <laughs> and we walked over hell and high water for Prabhupada, and so we all worked for him, we worked hard, we went out hours a day distributing books, distributing prasadam, cleaning the building, day and night, day and night, there was times we would work 24 hours straight without sleeping. So, fish karma, karma yoga. All for everything, for Krishna. If you can't do that, then Krishna says, at least give up the fruits of your work okay, to something noble. Huh? Because the whole idea is to become somehow detached. That, that false ego. I did the work, I get the fruit. To get detached from that. All right, I did the work, but really, it's his fruit, so I'll give him some. <laughs> <laughs> some for Krishna, some for me. Yadashnosi, yadkadosi, yadashnosi, yadadasi, yadati, This is, you know, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you offer, whatever you give away, everything. Do it as an offering unto me. And Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says, this is not really Ananya Bhakti, offering your eating and sleeping to Krishna. <laughs> but it's better to do that than to think that you're the proprietor of your eating and sleeping. You understand? At least you recognize that on some level it belongs to him. So if you can't do the Vaidhi, then you Nishkarm karma, you can't do that, then offer something to someone somehow and get detached. <laughs> but better than that is if you can start getting knowledge about detachment. And this is why you look in the second chapter, right? In the first half of the second chapter, Krishna teaches Arjuna, Sankhya, you're not the body, you're the soul. Why is he teaching him that? He says it in the 39th verse of the second chapter. He says, now I've taught you the knowledge of Sankhya, by which you can understand you're not the body. Now that you know you're not this body, you're not this false ego, mm -hmm. you're not the owner, you're not the proprietor, now I'm going to teach you Buddha Yoga, which is going to teach you how to become detached from the fruits of your work. How can you become detached from the fruits of your work if you think you're the body? Mm -hmm. and, the, and you have this false egotistical conception that you know, I'm Harry, I'm Charlie, I'm Dan, I'm Sam, I worked hard, I made the money, now I'm going out to have liquor. <laughs> you can't become detached from that conception unless you understand, I'm not that person. I'm the soul. I was born naked. I'm going to die naked. Huh? Like I told you the first night when I was here about my, my son. Mm -hmm. Two and a half years old, and he went into that space in his previous birth. And, Where's my servants? Where's my money? <laughs> he was obviously a wealthy guy, you know. <laughs> I said, Sorry, pal. <laughs> Not this birth. <laughs> we just got a little two bedroom apartment here. <laughs> yeah, your kids are enjoying that now. <laughs> 
So that's what happens. Whenever you, you come in with nothing, you go out with nothing. You can't take it with you. So when you get detached from the conception of trying to take the stuff with you, that's when you can give up the fruit of your work to Krishna. You understand? I think so. It's getting a little clearer. Is it getting clearer that there's steps, there's layers, mm -hmm. okay? Krishna wants you to have faith. Mm -hmm. If you can't give him rag right away, okay, you can't give me rag right away, divide you about the, you can't divide you about the, right, give me something. If you can't give it to me, give it to somebody. But don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, because I've got a bit lost, because it's all just so because much Because the Gita, is, the Gita is, is complicated. Yeah. I do a Gita seminar. I, you weren't here last year when no. I gave the overview of the Gita. No. And I do an expanded seminar in which I talk about it two hours, three hours at a time for three, four, five nights. And mm -hmm. you start to get a, a picture how the whole thing is structured. Mm -hmm. And this is important because it's the foundation. Mm -hmm. The Bhagavatam is built on top of the Gita. Mm -hmm. And the Chaitanya Charitamrita is on top of that. So um, you can't climb, you know, you can't just go to the top of the penthouse without having a foundation in the bottom of the building. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is you have to have the foundation. You have to have the Gita. Maybe uh, next time I come, we'll do... That would be great. Do you know when you're coming? Uh, not right now, but okay, we'll work on it. Okay. <laughs> that would be fantastic. I think we'll everyone make, We'll make three or four or five days where we'll just do the Gita. We'll go through the whole Gita, and we'll really understand what the Gita is about. Mm. Would you like that? Mm. I've heard uh, Ashram Maharaj do overviews as well. Oh, yeah. It just He's takes still... a while to sink in. Sure. <laughs> he knows. He knows. Yeah. The old timers know because we were hammered with the Gita. Every every day having Gita class. Yeah. Every day. Every day. And then Guru Dave, you know, he opened up a lot of a lot of avenues into understanding the mechanism of how the Gita works. Mm -hmm. So between the two, and there's a, you know there's a, each commentary has immense value in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada Guru Dave always used to say to all of his disciples. Read Swami Prabhupada's Gita first, and then read my Gita. Because for the Western mind, Prabhupada's Gita puts the things into perspective so that when you try to enter into the depth of what's being given in the next Gita, in Guru Gita, you can get there. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. By Guru Dev, you mean Sri Prabhupada? Uh, Sri Narayan Maharaj. Yeah. All right. Dave, you have any questions? <laughs> um, a, a little one. It's, um, um, it's uh, on, on the um, on the internet. There's the unexpected festival. In I think it's in June in Manchester. Um, is it? Is that right? In, in, in Birmingham. In Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, it's in the um, Gurdwara. Mm -hmm. And um, it was quite interesting for me because um, for my yoga studies, I'm going to be looking at the Jack G. Um, next, and and I just wondered if if you had um, any knowledge of Jap Jio and any comments about it. Any knowledge of what? Jap Jio. Jap Jio, and if, you know, which is it's the beginning of the um, the Sikh. Um, can, you, can you remember the word? Yeah, 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 yeah. the Guru Panther is is the first, the very first part. Oh. But I, I just wondered because because of the connection because it said. Um, well, you know, there's a story about uh, Guru Nanak, you know, he traveled all over India. And he had some pretty brilliant conceptions. Mm. There's a story about him one time, I think he was in Persia or Afghanistan, which was part of India at the time. Mm. And so uh, at night he laid down to go to sleep. And uh, a Muslim man was there and he said, y you've got your feet facing Mecca. So, he said, so Guru Nanak said, so? He said, well, you, you can't face your feet to Mecca. He said, why not? So 
God's over there. Okay. Show me where God is and I'll put my feet there. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but Nanak was a pretty bright personality, pretty spiritual personality. And when he went to poor, he actually met Mahaprabhu. And they did kirtan on the beach together. So that's, you know, part of what made him emphasize japa and kirtan. It's part of, you know, because of the mercy he got from Mahaprabhu, he made kirtan a very intrinsic part of his path. He, he actually met Mahaprabhu. Sri, yeah, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because that was quite interesting for me because the time when he was born is, is that time, so mm. it was quite interesting yeah. for me. Oh. Yeah. So I've quite a lot of sick yeah, friends. Yeah, he and, appears at the same yeah. time. His, his life crossed, his life cast yeah. crossed his mind. Well, it must be why the sick people, they're very attracted to Kirtan. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they have, they feel a kind of comradeship with, her, with devotees. Yeah. 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 Because it's a major part of their, a major part of their religious teaching, to perform mm -hmm. Kirtan. Right. And to distribute prasada. Mm -hmm. These are the two main things that he emphasized. You go to the Gurudwar in uh, Amritsar, they have an enormous kitchen. And they give out prasada. They give out food. Mm -hmm. This is their thing. So, um, Nanak, you know, he's a Kirtaniya, he's a, he's a Bhakta. And whatever he's giving is only one part of what Mahaprabhu gave. So, you know, you can go, you can chant, you can get involved on some level, but try and understand that you're only getting a piece of what's already here in its entirety. You understand what I'm saying? You can, I mean, there's a piece of Mahaprabhu's mission all over the world. Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who was Mahatma, broad-minded, Mahatma means broad-minded. So in, in 1876, when he wrote this uh, about how Mahaprabhu's movement would spread all over the world, he said, actually, Mahaprabhu's movement is already spread all over the world. He said, we can hear the strains of the Sankirtan movement in the streets of England and America, as the Salvation Army <laughs> marches down the street with cymbals and drum singing the names of God. This is the beginning of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan. You see. So yes, some of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement is in every religion. The Sufis, the Salvation Army, the Jap Corps in the, in the Guru Granth Sahib. It's there everywhere. The glories of singing the name of God. Christ tells his disciples, wherever there's two or more persons gathered in my name, I am present. David says, King David says, one should glorify the name of the Lord with cymbals, drum, and bell. In the Psalms. So it's there. There in every religion. The glorification of the holy name of the Lord is the process in this age of Kali Yuga. Even more powerful than your Java is when you go on that street and do Harinam Sankir. You know why? That's the Yuga Dharma. The Yuga Dharma is when you're on the street chanting the holy name in the public. That is the Yuga Dharma. The religion of the age? Huh? I'm trying to translate what Yuga Dharma means. Yuga Dharma means, means the process for, for purification in the age of Kali Yuga. Prabhupada once told his disciples when they asked him, Prabhupada showed them Radha Damodar Temple and he showed him his rooms and he said, this is where I prepared to preach in the West. So 
So one of his disciples said, well, how do we prepare? And he said, you don't have to prepare. I'm empowering you. <laughs> and once, Shamarani asked Gurudev, she said, but what is the meaning of our Harinam? We're going out on Harinam and we're chanting. We all chant Nam Aparat. So what is the value of our Harinam? It's just Nam Aparat. He said, no. He said, no. When you go out on Harinam under the order of Guru, it carries the potency of Guru. You can really feel that in a, in a Harinam. Yeah. Like when we're in London and people, they, they, they get transformed. Yeah. They, there's an effulgence around the group of devotees yeah. and people, you can see transformation go on yeah. their whole body and their face and they become absorbed. They come in and they dance and they start yeah. chanting. And sometimes they, they, they do it mockingly, like as if, you know, oh, great. Having, you know, but they're doing it. Exactly. <laughs> so, David, you've been on high notes, haven't you? Yeah. My yeah. yeah. So, do you understand what I'm saying here about the power of Hari Nam? When you're doing Hari Nam under the guidance, under the shelter of Prabhupada and Guru Dev, they're there. And your chanting has their potency. It's as if Prabhupada and Guru Dev are chanting that self in that Hari Nam. That's why I remember when we used to chant in New York City, we'd go around. I mean, I, I heard them chant. I moved in that day. And that was typical. We would go down the streets of New York here and there, and people would hear the chanting, and they'd just, they're like the Pied Piper. They'd call us home, and they'd end up in the ashram. That was the power of the holy name. Prabhupada, in the fourth canto, he said that there are Aryans there are people of more purified consciousness all over the planet, and when they come in contact with the Christian consciousness movement, immediately they come into it. You understand? Because Krishna consciousness accumulates birth after birth. So when you hear the pure chanting, it awakens your consciousness of your previous knowledge, and then very quickly you come to that platform. You understand? Mm -hmm. So the most important thing you can do is Harinam. At least once a week, this group should go out on Harinam Center. At least once a week. Do you think you guys can do that? <laughs> a collective holding <laughs> of breath. Yes, we have some shy people here. Yeah. Yeah. We started to last year, but I found it too much of a strain and got completely fried. Once a week, you can't do it like once a week? Too much of a strain? Not walking, no. I used to do it eight hours a day. I know you've got a problem, yeah. but I used to do it eight hours a day every day. Yeah, I, I would love that. If I lived in the temple, I would have wanted that to be my <laughs> We used to go out for hours to Harinam Sankirtan, and she stood on the street corners for hours distributing books. Powerful. Powerful. Eight, nine, ten, some, sometimes eleven hours. And, yeah. and then we would think, oh, I can't come back to, to the temple. There's still too many people out here. <laughs> but that, there, you could, we could feel the empowerment. We knew that it wasn't us. Yeah. It was Shiva Prabhupada's. Sam's calculating. <laughs> I understand Sam. I'm a street boy from New York. <laughs> I understand it completely. He's calculating. Okay, what's in this for me? How can I work this? How can I work this? What can I get? All right, so, I answer your question, Sue Yeah, that was really nice, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> Dan, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Not at the moment. Okay. Peter? Not at the moment. Braj? Thanks for the explanation. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Jagannath, you're in Samadhi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks your presence. Um, I have a question. Could you describe the qualities of Mahaprabhu and how do we view those qualities? Mahaprabhu's qualities I already explained. 
He's the most munificent avatar. He's the most giving. He's the one who benedicts us with the most mercy. He's the most merciful personality. He doesn't hold back. He gives out love of God to everyone. That's, he considers it his service to distribute love. So that's the mentality. The mentality is, if I distribute the holy name, if I distribute the shaman, if I distribute the love, the more I do that, the more I'm in the love, the more I taste the love, the more I feel the love. If you want love, then you have to give love. It's only by giving out whatever you get that you learn how to accept it. It's harder to accept love than it is to give it. Because there's this whole sense that we have that we're not worthy. We come from so many, you know, difficult, dysfunctional backgrounds. And we think, how can I take love? How can I, you know, why, why, why is this person giving me love? So we have a tendency to reject what Guru is giving us, what Krishna is giving us, because we don't know what it means to accept love. So Mahaprabhu, he makes it very easy. He says, you know what, if you just distribute the holy name by chanting in the streets and distribute prasadam and distribute books, if you just distribute, when you see what the transformation that's taking place in other people is they're getting love. Because I'll make that happen. Then you'll learn how to accept love. You'll learn how to accept the gifts that I'm ready to give. You follow? Thank you. Does that make it clear to you? Very clear. Sam, questions? You already know what I'm thinking. <laughs> you can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one way no. to work this, Sam. No, no, I have no question. Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I was doing. That was the second part. <laughs> yeah, no, I have no question. Jonathan, so you want to know which books you should read first. See, Srila Prabhupada, he approached this thing in a very similar manner to the way Srila Gurudev did. Srila Gurudev was always emphasizing, hear the Leela of Krishna. Okay. But then he told me personally, and he told others, that you need to explain the fundamentals to the devotees, because they don't know what it means. So, Prabhupada always had to study the Gita, because that's the fundamental. But then he always had us read Krishna book every night, because that's the Leela. He gave us both. That was our special reward at the end of the day, working hard, sit down together, all the boys and girls in the temple and we drink hot milk and read Krishna books. Bedtime stories. Mm -hmm. And so, this combination is very important. So, start with the Gita, that's one book, and also read Krishna book on a regular basis. But you can also read books like Bhakti Tattva Vivek mm -hmm. because that helps you to understand the fundamental principle of the Bhakti. And Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu makes you understand what pure devotional service is in the process of executing it. Okay. So these are some of the books also uh, 
nectar of instruction or the essence of all advice which you're reading? Yeah. A good book to start with. These are the books that we should be studying in the beginning. And then we can grant, you know, we should hear some Bhagavatam every day. We should, you know, gradually read Chaitanya Charitamrita and understand more about what Chaitanya. And gradually everything is given, little by little. And Lord Chaitanya is in Chaitanya Charitamrita. You can read about the glories of Mahaprabhu, of Nityananda, of the Dadar, of the Dwaita. You can read Rup Shiksha and Sanatan Shiksha. You can read Roy Ramadan Sambhad in the beginning and see how Mahaprabhu has Roy Ramadan graduate from the most basic conception of an ashram up to the point of praying. So we understand what is actually praying in relationship to everything else. So these are all things that are good to learn. So this is some insights on what you should be reading. Okay? Does that help? Yeah, it does. does uh, clear, um, make it clear for probably for me, but maybe for others as well. But you should always understand Thank you. Yeah. that the reading only becomes clear by hearing from the sadhu. If you don't hear from the sadhu, mm -hmm. then what you read will not become clear. Right. Follow? Yes, I do. Thank you. I, I, I have a question now. Now you got one. All right, so. I'm sorry. It's just because you just said that. Does that mean there's no point reading it on your own? No. It doesn't mean that. But it means that the real revelation comes by hearing from the sadhu and by performing service. It's an exchange. Transcendental knowledge is an exchange of love. You hear from the Son, it's personal. You have questions, he answers them. He gives you love in the form of spiritual knowledge. And it sits there latently in your heart. And at some point, when you love him back by doing some service, you may bring him a donation, you may bring him some food, just like Sue Baby wrote me some flowers, to express your love. Understand? You express your love, you do some service, you give something. And then, all the seeds of transcendental knowledge that is sitting there start to become revealed. You know what I used to do with devotees? I used to do this all the time. I tell them, okay, before you go and hear Srila Gurudev, I want you to read some chapters of the Bhagavatam or the Gita before you go to hear him. And then when you finish hearing him at the Badger Festival or this festival or that festival, you go home, read the same chapter. Oh my God, it's like night and day. I can't believe I missed all those things the first time I read it. You missed them. By hearing and doing service at the festival, they became revealed. They were all there in the first place. You only get to see them when you get involved in the exchange. You follow? So you can read, but how much you get out of it depends on how much you exchange your love. That's the angle. And in the end, the love you make 
The love you take is always equal to the love you make. Beatles. <laughs> I thought it was um, George Michael. Right? Can we have some kirtan Maharaj? Can we have? Yeah, how loud can I make? Um. <laughs> Not so loud. Just, yeah, I mean, I Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna. 